Hello and welcome to the first Hot Pixel Productions episode of Soup to Nuts, a beginning to end journey for long exposure photography. My name is Gerald Berliner, and in this series of videos I will be taking you through all the things you will need in terms of ancillary gear, filters and camera for long exposure photography. Then in later videos we will be going out on location to do some long exposure photography, then bringing back the images, getting them into the computer where I will share with you my complete workflow and approach to post processing for final delivery to a web browser near you. Now, whether you are a beginner or thinking of upgrading to a DSLR from a point and shoot, or you are an experienced photographer but have never shot long exposure photography before and are interested in learning about it, then these videos may be of some use to you. Now in this first video I will be showing you what you will need before setting out to shoot and then in part two we will be going behind the camera so we can look at the specific features that whatever camera you have or are thinking of getting should have for successful long exposure photography. So welcome aboard and let's get cracking. In this episode what I'm going to do is going to start at the very beginning and just going to lay out a little bill of fare here in terms of some of the equipment um, and additional bits and pieces you may uh, want to consider if you are about to embark on long exposure photography. Now, um, who is this video aimed at? Well, it is really aimed at what I would like to say as a, a very new beginner, complete beginner, uh, maybe to just regular DSLR photography, or you, you know, you're pretty much an intermediate level, but um, you know, you have been interested in uh, possibly experimenting with long exposure photography, so you know, this again may be of some use to you. Now, the good news is, if you are upgrading from or one of these at old point of shoot and you're looking at an um, entry level uh, DSLR or even a prosumer, wh whatever, whatever level you're looking at, there is no such thing as a, as, as a crap camera, excuse the language. Um, Sony, uh, Nikon, Canon, Pentax, Olympus. Uh, Fuji. Um, the, the market is just so competitive, not one of these brands can ever afford to create what would be euphemistically called as a duff camera. Um, but uh, obviously in terms of the different levels and price points of cameras, obviously you know they're going to increase exponentially and that could be the difference between a crop sensor um, camera to a full frame sensor camera and also uh, what features there are actually in you know, different shooting modes all kinds of doohickeys that you know maybe in the, the higher level um, cameras that uh, obviously you know increases the poise, uh, point, uh, price point. Now what I just want to be clear is that, that none of what I'm going to show you here is specific to a particular brand of camera um, but I do shoot with a, a Nikon D800 that's my main shooting camera which is here and I'm actually shooting this video with my D7100 which is obviously there. Um, but as I say, none of this equipment is sp specific, well, apart from one bit, but don't have to really worry about that. It's really just a question of whatever I show you here is just, you know, obviously finding an equivalent for your brand of camera that is compatible with it. And that's what it is. This, as I say, is, is pretty universal in terms of uh, the camera itself and not, as I say, it's just specific to Nikons, etc, etc, etc. So, let's begin. Where would I begin? Well, let's begin with what... Uh, is not exposure uh, photography, pretty obvious you think. But it is the ability through the use of filters in daylight hours or in very low light shooting situations to be able to exponentially extend the length of time of your exposure. Now it's a pretty common technique amongst photographers these days and, it, and it's very um, noticeable, it's very kind of unique in its look and feel. It's where you kind of see the very, very smooth, soft, ethereal look and feel to <clears throat> you know, flowing water, um, you know, big kind of like long stretch zoom cloud forms again because with the long exposure with the aperture open for a, you know, a long period of time, anything moving through your frame is going to take on a blurred kind of look, whether it's people, as I say, moving water still water, uh, clouds, etc, etc, etc. And it can be, as I say, a, a very nice effect to have um, in terms of creating a very kind of soft, as I say, ethereal kind of mood. Um, now, if you are going to embark on this, obviously one thing is going to be very, very key, and that is keeping the camera still and as locked down and as solid as possible. For, for that very reason, you really do want to consider a good, robust um, tripod and 
um, you know, uh, head attachment. And this, the one that I've got, is, is, is a Faisal, it's uh, carbon fibre. Um, the ball head here is an Arca Swiss, and it has a plate mechanism whereby the, there is a plate attached to the camera. You just unscrew it at the back, slide it out, and you're in. Screw it down, you're locked in, and you know, it, it's pretty solid. It also has a lot of um, tripods have hook underneath them as well. And that allow you to maybe you know put your bag, you know, your, your bag full of your heavy lenses or whatever you got, um, just to keep that up, as I say a little bit more locked down, a little bit more stable in wind. Because for the most part, that's going to be your well, you're going to, that's the main problem you're going to have to contend with 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 long exposure, particularly out in the field. It's going to be the camera being kind of buffeted, buffeted or vibrated by um, breezes or even quite strong winds. So as I say, you know you've really got to um, kind of get that really locked down. Um, what's good about particularly about this this vice on a lot of these um, kind of tripods is that the legs can move independently whereby you just can click it and you can shove that leg out or any of the legs out to come some very extreme angles which could be really, really good because you know it, it kind of it kind of gets you out of being just kind of constricted that so that very kind of typical triangular kind of mode of most tripods and it kind of, when you're in kind of very awkward low level um, kind of shooting situations to be able to kind of just extend those legs out, you know, to get extra stability is a very, very good thing to have. Um, now, again, in the spirit of keeping the camera as stable as possible, here's a very good tip. And it's almost like kind of what's wrong with this picture. Well, what's wrong with this particular picture is this the, um, the shoulder strap. If you keep that on, you're out in the field, breeze wind, this will act like a sail, the wind will catch it and it will start flattening it around against. The tripod and the camera that's going to build up vibration that is invariably probably going to get into your shot so what you need to be able to do is to just get this off now more often than not when you get your shoulder strap you get it out of the box or you've got it you know you have to affix it you know it slips into the eyelet and it's just it's just the strap and it goes through this kind of buckle thing and it tightens down this that and the other and it's kind of pretty much locked in there and to get it off it's kind of really pretty fiddly so what you might want to try and do is actually just take it off and actually affix it to um, some kind of a clasp or a hooking system. Now, the one that I grabbed hold of, this is actually, these are actually kind of very big, almost industrial sized jewellery clasps, you know, that you can just bend that back, the clasp opens up, you just clip it on, you're good to go. Now on the other side, over your shoulder, set your camera up, off, off it comes, into your pocket, you're good to go, take a shot, clip it back on, you're off. Um, you may also want to consider um, maybe a little bit easier to get hold of. Just pop down to your, uh, you know, Walmart even or uh, Home Depot, and you know maybe just pick up some of these very very small S spiners. Um, but again, which uh, this will clip onto the strap, that will clip onto the camera. Same same thing, and you're good to go. Um, I actually have, as you can see here, <laughs> these flapping around. I've actually got these two key rings actually attached to my eyelet. That was just because, like you know, virtual pitch darkness. They're kind of like just get these on and off. It was just a little bit more simple um, to have something a little bit bigger to kind of latch onto, so to speak. Um, but again, you know, I also have to be careful with these in terms of if it's very, very high wind or there is a kind of noticeable breeze and these start jiggling around. A little bit of gaffer tape either side just to kind of, you know, tape them down, make sure nothing's moving on that camera and keeping the camera really, really kind of say, locked down as stable as possible because, as I say, you're going into 15. 30 second, one minute, up to eight minutes, 10 minutes, you name it, it could be very, very long exposure. So keeping this really nice and locked down and solid is a real, um, really important thing to be able to do. Now, there's a couple of things that I always actually uh, keep in my bag, and this, again, a lot of this has actually been uh, born of <laughs> trial and error, and like, oh, gee, wish I had that. Um, particularly if you're going to be shooting in very, very low light situations, either the beginning or the end of the day, you know, you could be there before sun up or well after the sun's gone down. So for all intents and purposes, you could be in pitch darkness. Really good idea to have yourself a little headlamp like this that you can just obviously put around your head, you know, you arrive at your shot. Very good also to be able to find your way down to wherever you are going to be shooting, unless you know it really well or you have bat-like senses. Um, this is a really good thing to be able to have, so you're on there, you know, you're going to be behind your camera, you're going to be, you know, wanting to, you know, fiddle around with settings, you know, do your focusing or whatever it is you do, to be completely hands-free, so, you know, it's cold, um, is a good thing to have. So a, a good little headlamp is really, really useful to have as well. Now, the other thing that I also have in the bag is... <clears throat> 
Another kind of torch that actually can really kick out quite a, a, a good deal of light. Now this actually is one of my bicycle um, headlamps, which although very, very small, can really um, kick out a really, really bright light. Now this could be useful, um, not only obviously for helping you find your way, but also if you're in a very, very dark, low light situation, almost pitch black, focusing is going to be, you know, could be quite problematic in terms of obviously it's unlikely that your autofocus is going to be able to lock onto anything because it's going to be virtually pitch black and also even just seeing through the viewfinder, you know, unless you've got like a you know, very kind of bright star or something, uh, you know, just on the horizon, it could be very, very tricky. Having something like this that can actually throw out a really good deal of light, maybe like to the foreground or to the midground, that the camera can actually see and lock onto, then as I say, you can get, possibly get away with your uh, automatic focus being able to lock onto that lit area that you're throwing the lights onto with this very, very bright light. And so, you know, you could get, you know, quite a nice uh, crisp, sharp shot out of that just by, as I say, uh, also focusing on the beam of light or whatever this is hitting. Now, the other important, uh, very, very important tip um, that I think maybe <laughs> virtually everybody, I know I did, uh, when we first started doing uh, long exposure photography is 15 second, 30 second exposure, minute, 10 minute, you know, whatever. Minute, minute. You gotta make sure that you cover your rear viewfinder because with the aperture open uh, for that length of time, light is gonna get in through your rear viewfinder and you're gonna end up with a big magenta or white light streak across your resulting image. So, a number of ways you can do this. Actually on this D800E, it actually does have a little um, lever you just flick and it kind of brings down a visor that covers um, the rear view uh, finder. See if your camera has that feature. If not, uh, I actually went online and I just Googled it and uh, rear viewfinder cap for um, D7100. I came across this. So there are purpose um, made manufactured ones for a wide variety of cameras. I think if you're a camera sh uh, Canon shooter, um, it may actually be on the strap somewhere. It kind of maybe looks like a little buckle or a rubber thing. That actually is the, uh, that could actually be the actual rear, the <clears throat> Uh, viewfinder cover so just check on that as I say if you're a Canon shooter but if it is I do recommend that you take it off the strap because then again you could back could be back in the situation whereby you've got the viewfinder covered with a thing but it's attached to the strap and the strap's down again and you're back into that whole kind of flapping issue that you could have if it's breezy so as I say at a pinch a little bit of gaffer tape or something like that. Now something with a fairly kind of mild adhesive that you can just, you know, just stick lightly either side of the viewfinder. Obviously you don't want to push it onto the glass of the viewfinder, but just something you can maybe tack down. And, and as I say, I mean, if you're really up the creek, you know, maybe even just doing something like that, getting your hand very, very close to the viewfinder just to block out the light. But if you're doing a five minute exposure, chances are you're probably not going to want to do that. Okay, so there you go. Very critical, get that rear viewfinder covered when you're doing um, long exposure photography. Now, another very important um, piece of equipment that you can need for long exposure photography, that actually does tie back into this whole question of stability and keeping everything away, your mitts off the camera, so that again, you know, you're not running the risk of, of banging it or touching it, or again, you know, introducing any form of like blurring or vibration is the good old, cable release. Now this is basically a little device that will go into its respective appropriate slot on your camera and again it's going to be down to you to find out what cable release is going to be compatible for your particular brand of camera. This actually is the Nikon one for my D7100 which I'm obviously filming with but again this just connects into it and this is the button that you press in order to, to fire the camera to release the shutter so you know, press the button and you know that's how you do it and consequently as you can imagine with that obviously whoop, try and get this so it looks like it's attached obviously with this attached to the camera you're completely away no hands anywhere near it you take your shot you're good you should have a very 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 crisp sharp shot there now works the wise if you are going to get a cable release um, a physical one like this make sure that it, there is a locking device to this button in as much as you can somehow lock that button down so in essence the shutter will be remaining open. That's very very important when we go into bulb mode. That's a shooting mode with the camera that I'll go into a lot more detail a little bit later on. 
But again, you need to have a way of locking this button down because you obviously don't want to be standing there for four or five minutes or however long with your finger pressing down on this button. On this particular one, you just I just press the button down, I just move the whole unit forward, it slides forward and it kind of locks it down, locks that button down. I get a little orange smiley thing there to say that you're in lockdown mode. The shutter's going to be open and it will remain open until I slide it back. That button releases and shutter shuts. So, very important if you're going to get a cable release, make sure that it will allow you to shoot in bold mode by locking down that button. Now, another great alternative to the actual a physical um, cable release is a wireless cable release. Very, very useful indeed uh, for a variety of reasons. Now, this particular um, wireless release consists of a trigger, uh, uh, a transmitter, and a receiver. Now, this receiver is actually, again, it's, this is actually Nikon specific. This actually is, is a 10 pin a receiver that you can probably see here. Actually, it's what I use. And that's actually affixed to the front of the camera there. And I trigger it by just using, as I say, this transmitter, pressing this button to um, fire the shutter uh, for the camera itself. Now, it has a number of advantages, um, particularly, as I say, if you're doing very long exposure, like 10 minutes, <laughs> it's freezing. There's a nice hot flask of coffee in the car. Well, obviously, you just nip back off there, time's up, from the car, you're good to go. These are reputed to have a range of about 100 meters, so you can be a very long way back. Also very, very useful if you're shooting uh, towards the either uh, early in the day or towards dusk, where you've got you know, the sun behind you, you've got very, very long shadows being cast in front of you. At a pinch, you may be able to get away with camouflaging the camera and tripod in some foliage if it's kind of showing up in the shot. But with you kind of like hovering and lurking around with your cable release, your, your big fat heads, like you just can't get out of the shot. Obviously, this is a great uh, alternative. Is this will allow you to get completely out of shot, um, and as I say, you, you pretty much might have a quite a successful shot. Um, the other thing as well that this is going to obviously be very useful for is if you're a wildlife photographer. I know we're digressing a bit, but you know, you obviously can be a long way back in your bush in your hide. With your binoculars this is all set up waiting for the critter or whatever it is to come through you've got it in you know in uh, continuous high burst shooting mode so one press of this will fire off you know five exposures hopefully giving you you know a pretty good chance of actually getting quite a good shot of whatever it is that's uh, flapping around or, or um you know sniffing around uh, your camera so again pretty useful for wildlife photography again same thing though um, this is the, for the Nikon, this is the SMDV RFN4S kit for use with Nikon only, they say. Fear not, all of this equipment, uh, all of this gear, I'm going to put uh, links in the show notes uh, to it, so if you are a Nikon shooter, you'll be able to go and check them out. If you're not, it's the same thing, just check what, you know, just check whatever brand of cable, or wireless release is compatible with your particular brand um, of camera whether it's Canon, Fuji, Pentax, Olympus. I'm sure they make them for all of them. I certainly know they do for um, Canon. But again, have to make sure that you can trigger this um, wireless release to keep the shutter open for as long as you want in bold mode, um, just by, as I say, holding down a button. Now, with this particular one, it can, and it's really groovy. All I do is, I press it once, I keep my finger down on the button for two seconds, I'll get a purple light showing to say that, okay mate, good shot, you're in bold mode now, I'll keep the shutter open for as long as you want until you press me again, then I'll release it. I say that only because again, this was another learning the hard way. I actually got the specific Nikon wireless shutter release for this particular camera and it wouldn't do it. You had to keep your finger down on the button the whole time for the whatever length of exposure you want. Now, for five minutes, it's not a lot of fun. Uh, anything over a minute, it's probably not a lot of fun. So again, whatever brand of wireless uh, shutter release you're gonna get, read the small print, talk to your camera shop, find out if it can definitely shoot in bold mode for you, and again, you'll be good to go. Right, now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, probably one of the most critical components of long exposure photography, and that is the filters. Uh, and these are the things you're going to use 
um, particularly in daylight shooting, in order to cut the light down um, going into the camera so you can do extended long exposure um, photographs. First and foremost, if you are going to invest in any filters, the most important thing at the beginning that you're going to have to know is the diameter of filter that your camera lens is going to accept. Um, now, there are a few ways you can probably try and find that out, either reading about it, you know, the specs for it online or with it, or in the small print or the instruction it, com it comes with. Um, alternatively, what you usually may find is on the back of the lens cap, they will actually probably have that embossed. So, like on uh, my Nikon lens here, my 16 to 35, it's quite clearly got 77 millimeters. Um, stamped in the back here. And that's referring to the thread diameter or the diameter of this in order to clip on or screw on to the front of that lens. Okay, so again, you want to buy circular filters, got to make sure you know what diameter width of filter you're going to want. Now, first of all, right out of the bag, this is really just a, a, a UV filter. Essentially, it's just a clear um, piece of glass that kind of helps, you know, cut out a little bit of the ultraviolet light going into the camera. <clears throat> but primarily, I think what it's mainly used for is if you're one of these people that actually don't ever want to bother with the lens cap, which a lot of people actually don't. This actually will act to serve, or this will serve to act as some form of protection to the lens, the actual glass of the lens. God forbid you wang it into something or even once you drop it. Chances are that the um, filter, this UV filter, will absorb most of the concussion or the, the blow. And this will be the thing that will shatter, as I say, absorb the energy of the, the blow. And hopefully be the only thing that you're looking to replace. And I can't, obviously don't need to say it's going to be a lot cheaper to replace this here thing than this whole thing here. So again... That's something you might want to bear in mind, but again, as always, you've got to make sure it's scrupulously clean, you know, so obviously if you don't get any smudges or, or this, that and the other. The second one I have in my little bag is what is a CPL, you know, it's kind of euphemistically called, or colloquially called a CPL. That stands for a circular polarizer. Now this is a very, very useful uh, filter. What it basically does is, as you might uh, surmise, it cuts down uh, and cuts out the polarized light bouncing off reflective surfaces, ostensibly glass, um, the surface of water. So what this will actually do is say it will cut down the glare and actually bring into the shot a lot more detail about maybe what's going underneath that water, whether it's in a really nice um, rock formation or whatever. This is a very, very useful tool to have in your bag in order to do that. It can also help to kind of darken down sort of <clears throat> very sort of bright skies that might be kind of blowing out in the shot. Uh, and also just, it, it really can help just punch the overall kind of saturation or, or the vibrancy of a shot if it's on a particularly sort of flat, lifeless kind of grey day. Now, this basically has the screw in thread, but the front glass actually can turn through 360 degrees backwards and forwards, and that's kind of what you do. You kind of just screw it on gently, and we'll go into that in a minute. Once that's kind of there, you can then start to move this around. Now the optimal position that you want to be using this polarised um, filter is, is when you're at 90 degrees to the sun. That's when you get the best effect from it cutting out the polarising light. So, you know, sun's behind you, you know, you, you're going to have a pretty, pretty good effect. And you'll notice when you start to turn this around, Areas of the image through, that you'll see through the viewfinder will darken down as it's cutting out that polarised light and you'll begin to be able to see a lot more detail, as I say, behind reflective glass or under the surface of water. Um, this actually does have a slight ton of tint to it in terms of darkening things down, so when you put that on, you will notice that you will need, in general, a slightly longer exposure time uh, for your shots with this on. Right, so let's now turn our attention to the... Um, the kinds of filters that you're going to need for um, daylight long exposure photography, that is the ND filters. Now, ND stands for neutral density, and what these basically are are different opacities of dark glass. Now, the ND is usually followed by a number. So, for example, this is an ND6 filter, this is an ND10. Now, Basically what it is, is the higher the number, the darker the glass. So my ND6 is 
a little bit more transparent and opaque than my MD10. And that number actually correlates to the number of additional stops that the filter is going to afford you. So the MD10 filter is giving me an additional 10 stops uh, to play with and the MD6 obviously has an additional 6 stops of, uh, of, of time, the, the, the sake gives me an extra 6 stops to play around with. And as I say, this is slightly more transparent than this. So the exposure time usually with an ND10 is going to be quite significantly longer than it is going to be with an ND6. Now you can get ND3s, ND4s, ND5s, all the way up you know, through to ND10, maybe beyond. There is something you can also do if, um, as I say, shooting circumstances dictate. These actually can screw together. So you can actually um, piggyback one on top of the other. So I've got my ND6 going on to my ND10, consequently giving me um, the equivalent of an ND16 filter. So if I fancy being there all morning taking a long exposure, this is the way to go. And again, it depends on what you're shooting and what you're shooting that you, you may need to get down if it's, it's particularly bright or you, know, you want to go super long. With these screw on filters, you've got to be very, very gentle and very, very careful. You need a bit of patience, particularly when you first get them, because sometimes they just take a little bit of you know, finessing to kind of you know, get on there. Also, if you're in an extreme position and you're kind of trying to get this on, it can be a bit awkward, and particularly when you've got, you know, you're in minus 25 degree temperatures, trying to use de de dexterous finger movements with these when your fingers have basically fallen off, again, can be a challenge. If you inadvertently, unfortunately, drop one of these, but it's great, it's just fallen on like the soft earth or soft grass or sand or whatever, you, the, the, the one or five second rule does not apply in terms of a quick, good to go. Have to be very, very, very scrupulous in making sure, scrupulous in making sure that these threads are totally clean and don't have any kind of grit or anything on them. A grain of sand, or whatever. Trust me, you know the last thing you want to hear is that awful kind of like as you kind of like start screwing on, and you know you've got some grit in there. The threads on these lenses are, are pretty delicate, so it doesn't take an awful lot to to kind of damage them, um, which could be quite expensive um, to replace. And you know, also you know, as I say, when I say be patient and be gentle with this, it could be quite easy to cross thread these when these go on the front, you know. You know, and you kind of you think you're there, but you're not. You give it that final push. It's cross thread. It's jammed. You know, you're probably going to need either a, you know one of these special devices that will help kind of unscrew it, or you may even have to end up being taking it in to be kind of done by a pro. This, as, you, as, as obviously, this is a circular thread screw on um, system for filters. The other system that is available and very very popular with a lot of photographers is the Lee system. Now, the Lee system in terms of its principle is exactly the same as what you're doing with the circular, but in terms of its construct and the way it fits onto the camera, onto the lens, is very, very different. First of all, the glass is not round. It is rectangular pieces of glass. Uh, I think the most common size is 4 inch square, uh, 100 millimeters. And there are several components to the Lee system. The first one being what they call the adapter ring. Now, the adapter ring is kind of like um, your lens hood in terms of it doesn't screw into the thread inside the lens, it actually just will go onto the outside of the lens pretty much like, as I say, the lens hood does. Then there's another plate that attaches to that. That plate actually has kind of um, guide rails on it, like slots. That's on, you take a square piece of ND glass or you know whether you've got a grad filter, or soft grad, hard grad, and you just literally slip that um, piece of glass down in front of the camera. Uh, and then you know you can then slip another one in front of that, you know, if you want to maybe use a polarizing filter in front of your ND. And there's lots of different permutations, um, you know, which is great. Um, if you are very interested in the Lee system, I do wholeheartedly recommend you check out their channel on YouTube. They've got some fantastic um, videos on professional um, uh, landscape photographers like Joe Cornish working with the system, totally explaining how it's used and like how you can stack and you know um, marry different uh, lenses together, or sorry, to filters together to get some very, very sweet photography. Now last I think, 
and by no means least, if you're going to be shooting a long exposure, you have to have the ability to be able to calculate the additional amount of time that you're going to need once you've got your filter on. So let's just say, for example, quickly shove on my ND10. Now, I'm going to get ahead of the game, but okay, so you, you've got it on there, you're all set up to go. Uh, how do you calculate how much more time you've got to give this exposure to get you know, a pretty well balanced um, exposure or something that looks halfway decent? Well, what you're probably going to need, unless you are extremely clever with arithmetic and can figure out stops and time, is that you're probably going to want to need a conversion chart. Now, depending on which um, filter you've got in terms of its ND number, whether it's ND6, ND10, ND8, ND5, ND3, trust me, they all exist, you want to get its corresponding conversion chart. Now, <laughs> you see, this is one that I actually just got off, you know, it's a PDF off, off a website, it's, a, it's for the ND10, and what it basically does is it gives you, whatever your reading is, say for example, uh, let's say that you, you've got a meter reading, meter reading of one thirty of a second and it's then going to give you the amount of time you're going to need for that exposure if you're going to be using an ND10. So at one thirty of a second, if I've got a meter reading of one thirty of a second, I'm going to need an exposure of around about 34 seconds. So you know, that's a fair amount of time. Now as you can see this one actually looks a little bit more like Magna Carta at the moment. <laughs> Because as I say, it got a lot of use in the beginning. Now, as you can probably imagine in this digital age, there actually is also an app for that. In fact, there are several apps for that. Um, some of which are around about three bucks, one ninety nine, the usual fare, four bucks. As is always the case, I just found one. It was the cheapest, it's the simplest, it was free. It doesn't get much cheaper than that. It's just called the Long Exposure Calculator and it couldn't be simpler. You call it up. You dial in whichever ND filter you've got on. So, okay, I've got the ND10 on, and I metered, and it gave me an exposure value of a sixth of a second. So it will then calculate that based on those two readings, or with the ND10, I'm gonna have an overall exposure time of two minutes, 50 seconds. So let's have a look here. Let's just check my little cheat sheet here. Okay. I think we're done for this one. You're probably breathing a sigh of relief. Glad that's over. Well, I don't know. Hopefully, this might have been some use to you. You picked up a few uh, little tips on some of the uh, <clears throat> ancillary gear that you're going to need. So, what I'm going to do now is going to end up. What I'm going to do, I'm going to we're going to come behind the camera and again look at some of the modes, some of the um, shooting features that you, it's, you're going to pretty much need, no matter what brand of camera you've got, entry level right up to you know pro level, um, to do as I say, efficient and successful. Uh, long exposure photographs. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.